Welcome back to the second part of our Moon Phases Cup. So I had mentioned in the previous video that a viewer had asked me to provide commentary over the Watch Me Work series that I did for the Moon Phases Cup. And this is the second part of that video series. If you haven't watched the first, I highly recommend that you go and take a look at that one before you watch this one. This video covers the actual process of etching your piece, the cleanup work, and then the forming and finally polishing. So let's get started. You can etch sterling silver using a chemical called ferric nitrate. I get my ferric nitrate from a company called Science Company, and you can find it online, and I get the 500 gram bottle. You can see that it is a kind of a purple crystal, and you mix this with water to get your etching solution. There's also a way that you can electro etch, but for my process, I just use the ferric nitrate. Ferric nitrate will etch sterling silver, but not copper. For copper, you want to use ferric chloride. So I've mixed some up already, and I keep it in a container, a plastic container. I use this particular container because I can suspend my pieces in it. And I typically can use it over and over for quite a long time. As the chemical gets diluted, you will find that it takes longer to etch or it doesn't etch as well. I start this by putting it in a hot water bath to heat up the solution. You could probably also use a crock pot, but I just find it just as easy to put a pot in my sink and fill that up with hot water. My water gets very hot. So I just fill my pot up with hot water and put the container with my ferric nitrate solution in the hot water bath and let it heat up. I usually let it heat up while I'm putting the resist on the back of my piece, but I've already done that. So I'm going to go ahead and fill this up and let it set for about 10 to 15 minutes before I get started. I didn't mention this earlier, but the formula that I use for the etching solution is 400 milliliters of distilled water to 300 grams of the ferric nitrate. You always wanna add the crystals to the water, never the other way around. I mentioned that I suspend my pieces. I typically just use a wooden chopstick to suspend my pieces into the solution. Now we will just wait for this to warm up. This is the piece that we applied the resist to in the previous video. We just want to suspend the piece into the ferric nitrate solution. And we can do that using the chopstick. We don't want the piece to touch the bottom of the container. And we want to make sure that it is below the surface of the solution. So we just tie the string around the chopstick and secure it where it will be suspended in the middle of the solution. Once we have that ready, 
because we've allowed this to set for a while, I want to go ahead and heat up that water again. So now we want the piece to set for 20 minutes. So we need to set a timer for 20 minutes and then we'll come back and check on its progress. While we're waiting on that, I'm going to go ahead and get a couple of containers of water ready so that we can rinse the piece. The first container just has water in it. And the second container will add water and some baking soda. And the baking soda will allow us to neutralize the ferric nitrate. And you'll find that you use baking soda a lot, so you might as well keep a big box. So just put a couple of scoops of the baking soda in the water. Just stir that up. We'll be needing that later. I'll be using this soft makeup brush to brush off the solution each time I check it. So I go ahead and set that to the side so that I'm ready to go. We'll come back when the timer goes off and check our progress. So we can just remove it from the solution and using the soft brush that we have, we just gently wipe off the solution. And we do this to remove any residue that has collected on the piece and this helps to get rid of the striations that sometimes occur. So we want to rinse our brush in the baking soda and water solution and then the clear water. At this point I'm going to heat the water back up again. And we heat the water because the etchant works much faster if it's a heated solution. Now we can go set our timer for 20 more minutes and we'll check back on the progress. So we are now 40 minutes into the etching and I only etch my pieces for an hour. So we're going to check the piece again and this is when you will start to notice a considerable difference. So far our toner resist is holding up quite nicely and I'm not seeing any of the toner coming off of the piece which is what we want to see. And again I'll heat the water back up. You never want to dispose of the ferric nitrate solution down your sink. It is harmful to the environment which is why we have the separate containers so that we can place the piece and rinse out our brushes and stuff in the baking soda solution in the plain water and we, we will need to dispose of those through whatever hazardous waste process your city has but do not pour this stuff down the sink. Now we set our timer for the last 20 minutes. So 
So that was the last 20 minute session for the etch. And now it's time to check and see just how well our etching did. So as we did before, we wipe off the excess solution. And our toner held up through all of those etchings. Now we're back here at the ultrasonic cleaner with my ammonia solution. I've cleaned the piece, I've dried it off. I'll remove the resist from the back side and we shouldn't see any etching on the back. And that did a really good job, that vinyl did protect the backside. So now we want to remove the toner, the remaining toner, from the piece. And we can just dip it in our heated ammonia solution and use the soft brass brush and just give it a good scrub. And that should remove the toner. Might take a little elbow grease, but you should be able to remove it all. Now we can begin our finishing work. I chose the 5.75 inch pattern on my six inch blank because I wanted to make the smaller cuff. So I'm just taking a moment to cut away the excess with a jeweler saw using a three op blade. It's time to begin shaping the piece and refining it. So I like to start with a number two flat file and round off those sharp edges. And I can flatten that end where I saw that little piece off. And once I get all of the edges rounded, then I'll switch over to my number four ring file, which is flat on one side, rounded on the other but I'll just use the flat side to refine those edges some more. Once the corners are rounded, I start working on the sides of the piece. Because I didn't mask the edges, the edges are a little rough, so I just take some time to run those edges along my flat file and then come back and refine it with the ring file. I'm just trying to get rid of any of those rough edges and make it as smooth as possible. And then I switch over to my sanding stick with the sandpaper wrapped around a hard wooden piece and then just sand the edges and the corners just to further refine it. Once all of your sanding is done and you're satisfied with how the piece looks, then it is time to start forming. But before we do that, we need to make sure that our metal is nice and annealed because we're going to be shaping it around a die. So get your torch, whether it's a butane torch or an acetylene torch like I have here. Just heat that up until you get that properly annealed. And one little trick that I use is to mark the piece with a sharpie and when that sharpie disappears then you know that you've brought that up to the correct annealing temperature. And then let that cool for just a moment and then you can put that in the pickle pot to get rid of any oxides that have occurred from the heating process. Now it's time to start 
forming our bracelet. So I use a bracelet forming die that I got from Contenti and I'm just placing the carrier rod into my vise and just making sure that it is secured well. And I have a number of different dies. This one is just a flat die. It's the larger flat die. And I begin by simply shaping the bracelet by forming it around this die. If you don't have this forming die, then you can use an oval bracelet mandrel. But you'll definitely need something that you can shape that bracelet around. So I have my annealed piece and I just begin by pushing that bracelet around that die and you can see that it is forming around the die because it's nice and soft. And I'm just going for a general shape here. I can then switch out to my concave die and this particular die has a larger side and a smaller side and my cuffs fits the smaller side so I just take my nylon hammer and I start to form that piece around that die just gently tapping around to make that concave shape you may have to go over this several times to get the exact shape but just keep working at it until you get a nice uniform shape around that die. If you're interested in getting one of these bracelet forming dies yourself, I will leave a link in the details section for the particular one that I ordered from Contenti. Now that I'm happy with the shape, You'll see that it's a very rounded and I need a more C-shaped cuff. So this die comes with a smaller concave die. And so I take that smaller die and I start to concentrate on each side of the cuff. You'll have to play around to see what's the best place to start using this die, but it's about the last quarter of each side that I focus on and I'll get a more c-shaped cuff instead of that rounded cuff. So just work on bringing those sides in a little more and just through trial and error you'll get the shape that you need. We're getting to the final stages now. So at this stage, I like to patina my piece. Make sure you clean your cuff really well in an ammonia solution before you apply the patina. You could use liver of sulfur. I prefer to use Midas Black Max. I get this from Rio Grande. I like this particular patina because I can get a darker finish and I just use a paintbrush to apply it where I want it. And you'll notice that I'm just applying it inside of that frame. So I just take the time to paint this on. You can see it gets pretty dark. And I just paint it all around the cuff. You want to keep a container of water and baking soda on hand because you need to neutralize this piece after you apply the patina to stop it from further uh, darkening your piece. It can also turn a kind of rust color later if you don't do this step. So be sure that you are neutralizing the piece and you need to do this whether you're using Black Max or Liver of Sulfur. Either one requires you to neutralize it. If it's not dark enough, you can paint on several layers. Be sure and close up the container of Black Max. Don't let it sit on your desk. It can actually cause your tools to rust. 
just ask me how I know. But uh, you also want to clean your brush off well. Don't leave any of that solution on your brush. Throw away anything that has that patina on it. So any paper towels or anything like that, get rid of it. So we're neutralizing the piece. Just make sure that it's neutralized really well. And then once we're done neutralizing it, we just need to rinse the piece off in clean water. After you have neutralized your piece, rinsed it really well, and dried it off, you can go in and remove any of the patina from those raised spots. So this shape has a concave shape, so in order to get into the groove that I've created, I just wrapped sandpaper around a wooden dowel but I'm just going along the top of that and removing the patina from the uh, raised areas. It's taking away a little more patina than I had wanted, but this may be an effect that you want where it just kind of leaves the patina around the edges. But I do go back in later and I reapply the patina after I've polished it, and then I just do a light polish after I'm done so that I don't ruin the finish that I was after. So I just spend time removing any of the excess patina that I don't want. Once you're finished sanding off the excess patina, just wipe the piece down really well and then we will begin polishing. I have a jewel tool that I use when I'm polishing my pieces, but if you don't have one, don't worry about it. You can use something like 3M polishing papers and just go through the progression of papers and that will give you a nice lovely shine as well. But to save myself some time and energy, I go ahead and use my jewel tool. I'm using a inside ring polisher for the inside of this cuff. It works really well. And I use a polishing compound called ZAM. So actually it's like a buffing compound. And it works really well as, not, as well. You can see it brings up a, a really nice shine. But I concentrate on getting the inside of that cuff polished first. And you'll have to apply some more compound as you go. And it is quite messy, so don't be surprised if your fingers get black. When you're using this and polishing, it can generate a lot of heat. So you may have to use some alligator tape or something around your fingers. It especially does this when you're, when you're um, polishing rings because they're smaller pieces. Just be careful not to burn your fingers. I'm switching over to a polishing wheel. You see I have it labeled as ZAM. There's a, another product that I use sometimes before I use ZAM, which is White Diamond. So I label my wheels so that I know which compound to use with which wheel. You don't want to cross contaminate. I'm just focusing on polishing the edges of the cuff now. And now I can start focusing on the top of the cuff. This does take a bit of time to do, so just be patient 
and work slowly and you'll be surprised at how nice and shiny this piece turns out. Once you're finished polishing your piece, if you used a polishing compound like I did, you will need to clean that piece off with an ammonia solution, a warm ammonia solution, and that will remove all of the leftover uh, residue that remains from that, that polishing that you did. And then I just take a polishing cloth and polish it up a little further. And you see it's a nice shiny finish to it. I did lose all of my patina so I did go back in and reapply that patina and then I did just a light uh, polishing on the piece. I'll show you two examples of how you can finish out this piece. The first is what we went over in this video. It's got the concave shape and it just has a patina applied and then polished. The second example I actually set a moonstone where the full moon is and I didn't concave it. I hope you liked this extended version of the Moon Phases Cuff. If you like these videos, please consider subscribing and be sure and hit the like button. Thank you.